Hey everyone, and welcome back to the channel. Today we're going to talk about the ruminant intestines, talking about the portions of the small and large intestine, and essentially following the path the food would take from the stomach towards the anus. So what we have here in yellow, I've marked, uh, as well as the red and baby blue right here, these are all portions of the small intestine. We have the duodenum, the jejunum, and the ileum. I'll mark these next ones in blue. What we have then is the large intestine. So this is the first portion, as well as the purple. This is all the first portion, which is the ascending colon. We'll get into more detail shortly. In the black up here, we have the transverse colon. And here in brown, we have the descending colon. And these three that I've now marked in blue are parts of the large intestine. So let's backtrack and get started where the food is entering the small intestine, the duodenum. So for the stomach, really, we've covered this in the other videos, but we'll touch on it again. This distal portion of the stomach is called the pyloric region. Okay, and this is the most distal region of the stomach, and it's going to transition from the stomach epithelia into the intestinal epithelia uh, after this pyloric region. Okay, so that's the most distal part of the stomach, but where the junction actually is between stomach and intestine, we have a flexure that occurs in this region. And this flexure will lead into the duodenum, and it's the cranial duodenal flexure. So that's the, the starting point, basically, of the duodenum. The duodenum has a few other portions. So far, we've started cranially coming from the head region. The food has traveled down the esophagus into the stomach. Now we're moving from the stomach and getting into the intestine. So once we're in the duodenum, we go down caudally, and this is called the descending portion of the duodenum. I won't write this in, I'll just talk about it. Then we have a transverse portion. Okay, this transverse portion, it's called transverse because it's going from the right side towards the left side of the median plane. And then basically, we will start ascending again and going back cranially, and this is the cranial or sorry, the ascending portion of the duodenum. Right here, where we have this junction between duodenum and the jejunum, this flexure point that we can see, there's a bend. This flexure point, it has its own name, and it's called the duodeno jejunal flexure. Just a mixture of the two components, the duodenum and jejunum, and add flexure to it, and you have the name. So that's the duodeno jejunal flexure. Another important point to, to touch on is this tissue that I've marked in gray and now going over it in black. This is the, uh, it's a really important fold for orienting ourselves when we open the abdomen and try to figure out where we are. And this fold is called the duodeno colic fold. And it's called that because it's attaching the duodenum to the descending colon. So that's really important for orientating ourselves, and uh, it really helps, basically, for uh, any type of abdominal surgery if you're trying to maneuver. The next part of the small intestine is the jejunum that I marked here in red. The jejunum, it's fairly basic. It's a tubular region of the small intestine that's providing a lot of surface area for nutrients to be absorbed and to finish or uh, come close to finishing the digestive process. So the jejunum is really long. And because it's really long, it needs support so it doesn't get tangled or get other things tangled and create torsions that are really pathological. And so because of that, we have what I have here in gray and now going over in black. This is all the mesojejunum. And it's mesentery, which means it has serosal fluid that it's producing to help lubricate the abdominal cavity, but it's also really important because this mesojejunum 
I'll write just the name. The mesojejunum is loaded with lymph nodes. And we'll see in histological samples that the ileum is actually uh, has lymphatic structures called Peyer's patches built into the epithelium. But in the mesojejunum, we have a lot of these lymphatic structures and lymph nodes that are there to help detect antigens. So that's also really important and very clear uh, when we open up the abdomen to see the lymph nodes of the mesojejunum. The next portion is the ileum, and this is the final portion of the small intestine. The ileum is marked here in the light blue. To find where the ileum really is, we use this border that is marked by the fold I'm covering right now in black. This fold is called the ileocecal fold, and it's connecting the ileum to the cecum. In green, we have the cecum here. And this uh, fold basically tells us where the end of the jejunum is, but also where the beginning of the ileum is. So that's really important as well for helping orient ourselves. The next part where the food will be traveling is basically going into the large intestine and leaving the small intestine. Some of the food is going to go sideways into the cecum. The other chunk of the food and the majority of the food where it's going is into the ascending colon, which is in the dark blue. The cecum itself, it's a little different in different species. In the ruminants, it's more sac-like. There is no smooth muscle tinea that are creating these saccule structures. Uh, it's, it's just a sac that we see that's a, attached at the junction between the small and large intestines, also called the ileocecal junction in this region. And basically the food will enter into the cecum, but really the main direction of flow is going to be towards the ascending colon here in dark blue. The ascending colon has two different sections, just like what we saw in the ruminant, sorry, in the intestines of the pigs. We have in blue the centripetal coils. Okay, and then in purple, we have the centrifugal coil. But both are actually part of the ascending colon. Okay. The portion that we see in the middle right here, there's a junction between the ascending, uh, sorry, the centripetal and the centrifugal coil. This is called the central flexure. And it's just the turning point where the loop goes from looping inwards at the centripetal coils. It's looping tighter and tighter inwards. And then at the central flexure, we're going to start looping reverse. So it's going to start looping outwards again. And then eventually we're going to get to this distal part of the ascending colon. What's important to note is that what is different in the ruminants uh, ascending colon sections is that at the, uh, the start of the ascending colon, before the centripetal coil, we have right here a flexure, and they call this the ansa coli proximalis. Uh, ansa, I believe, is just a term for connection or connecting uh, point, but uh, basically the ansa coli proximalis, and I'll write that here, is the starting point, uh, the starting flexure of the ascending colon. But when we have a proximal portion, we also have a distal portion. And right here, in purple, we have the ansa coli distalis, which is another little loop that is getting right to the, uh, basically, the end of the ascending colon. From here, what we have is the ascending colon going into the transverse colon. 
Now the ascending colon leading into the transverse colon where it's switching from the right plane to the left plane. Uh, the diagram doesn't do a good job of it here that I've drawn. I was trying to make the spirals cleaner looking, but uh, basically we're going to have a continuous thickness of the ascending colon to the transverse colon. It doesn't all of a sudden become thick like the black transverse colon that I've drawn here. It will be continuous. So just try to imagine that. But basically we're going to have the food go from the ascending colon into the transverse colon, crossing the median plane, and then going down the descending colon. Okay. In the descending colon, there's one more flexure that's really important, and it's just it's called a sigmoid flexure because it's S-shaped. And the sigmoid flexure is unique to the ruminants. And basically, once we pass the sigmoid flexure, the food is clear to enter the rectum and then finally out the anus. Now I'm going to clean it up just to show blood supply briefly. Um, Give me one second. Okay, great. So when we're looking at blood supply, again, we have the cranial mesenteric artery, which is going to come in just caudal to the transverse colon, and it's going to give all sorts of branches supplying the small intestine, the large intestine, branches towards the cecum, and uh, basically this cranial mesenteric artery is going to give the most branches. Even to the stomach, we'll probably get some branches coming off in the transverse colon. So this is the cranial mesenteric artery. We'll also have a caudal mesenteric artery, but this one's going to be more limited in its supply, mostly supplying this descending colon. Great. And that's basically it for this video. In the next video, we'll cover another set of intestines and uh, basically make our way through the intestines of the domestic species. Thanks a lot. See you in the next video.